later on though it was quite interesting as i got to know some of the men better and we talked about more kind of deep and meaningful things it was interesting to discover the points of similarity so i remember one conversation with a uh, um a black man from south london roughly the same age as me both born in the same year and we were talking about our kind of lives before prison and what i thought was really interesting is we both developed the same kind of really flawed attitude to being a man uh, from very different parts of it. So, so so we both felt this really strong need to be seen as strong to be seen as in control to not show weakness and we were from completely different parts developed those very similar attributes and in my case it came i think from a, i went to a particularly unpleasant prep school when i was seven eight nine years old and I think the kind of lessons I internalized there were that to ever show weakness made you vulnerable. It meant pain and fear. And that, that from, from that point on, I, I learned to build this shell around myself almost, like this sort of layers of, of protection where I never really let anyone in, never let anyone see what I was actually feeling or if I was worried about things or scared about things. And in, in a very similar way, this chap I'm thinking of and, and many other men like him developed that sort of habit from their upbringings as well. Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy and this is the Locked Up Living podcast where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning, six o'clock UK time for a fresh podcast. Today we're really pleased to welcome along David Shipley. David is a former prisoner who writes and speaks on crime issues and is also currently studying for a PhD. So really glad you could join us today, David. Welcome. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, David. Hi, David. Really nice to meet you. Thanks very much indeed for coming along. He writes a lot of thought-provoking articles about prison in the UK and, and somehow you manage to get them published in places that we don't usually associate with progressive attitudes towards crime, for example, the spectator. How do you manage this? I think where I start from is that if we want to fix our prison system, and I believe our prison system is appalling, and I've, I've been in it, and I've seen how dreadful it is, then we need to make this an issue which people all across the political spectrum care about. Uh, if all we're doing is talking to people who are already good liberal progressives who already think we should reform our prisons, we're not changing anyone's mind. So I think it's actually really important to take the argument to unpredictable and unfamiliar audiences. And in terms of places I've written about these issues in The, the Spectator and in CapEx, I think, I will say this for the Spectator, they're a really broad-minded publication and they will publish all sorts of different viewpoints i think that's a great strength of kind of fraser's leadership there i think how i've tried to approach the pieces i write though is i've tried to make them very much grounded in fact there are actually lots of arguments for prison reform that do appeal to maybe more right-wing people reoffending is hugely wasteful it costs the country 18 billion pounds a year Reoffending tears at our social fabric, reoffending damages and destroys families. You get intergenerational transfer of criminality. And all of these things are terrible. And I think if we want a country that functions well, we should have a justice and prison system which makes people less likely to reoffend when they leave the prison than they were when they went in. And you want a system that actually works, maintains discipline, teaches good behaviour, teaches people to be pro-social, not selfish and antisocial. And so I don't think the arguments I make in favour of prison reform are necessarily left or right wing. I think they are simply arguments about what doesn't work now. How do we actually turn this into a system that we can be proud of and that delivers on what it should do? So I think that's perhaps why my arguments resonate more with right wing people than other arguments for prison reform, because I'm not just basing it in arguments based on maybe compassion or empathy for, for criminals, I'm, I'm more focused on, on what would make it work better. I think you touch on some really interesting points there, David. If, if we want to change people's minds, people need to be having conversations. And I think at the moment, society feels very polarised. And that, that isn't going to change anyone's mind if people just decide that you want to obliterate conversation or arguments that doesn't come from a stance that you agree with. Certainly, I found myself reading stuff in The Spectator because it, it said something that 
people perhaps weren't really talking about ordinarily, but was rooted in, in fact. And I've also contributed several times in the last few months to GB News, which has a similar reputation for being right wing, but actually found that they were willing to have quite nuanced discussions about things that did matter in terms of justice. I think it's important to try and have conversations in a way that ordinary people can hear, not yeah, just I, preaching I, to the converted. No, I, I absolutely agree. And I think the Daniel Khalif escape a few weeks back was a great example of this, where suddenly the whole country was talking about prisons. And I think there were some people who were coming out saying, oh, we shouldn't be raising these issues because it'll just be used as a stick to say that prisons aren't tough enough. Okay, but if the, the alternative is not to say anything. If, if, if public attention is on prisons, this is a time to, to raise these issues and make them more salient. Um, and I don't think it's all bad. Uh, a few weeks ago, the, the Daily Mail published an article, quite a grim piece, where they'd, they'd followed this woman who was a prisoner at an open prison and was out going out on licence to work in a McDonald's. They followed her around her day, taking photos of her, and wrote this dreadful piece where they, despite saying nothing about the actual woman's offences they just tried to link her to other terrible people who had been in the same prison and the terrible crimes they'd done i wrote a response to that saying hang on let's actually look at the benefits of work on rot or how they reduce reoffending, how they are actually getting prisoners out of their cells so instead of staring at four walls and a tv they're doing something good and productive with their days what certainly surprised me was that the response on the daily mail's own website was pretty negative a lot of, of, of the Daily Mail's own readers were saying, hang on, actually, she's doing an honest day's work. This is good. This is a positive thing. She's paying taxes. And I think sometimes we can convince ourselves that our arguments won't be well received. And actually, if, we, if we're making arguments that I think are grounded in fact and based on principles of fairness, generally, most people are pretty receptive to them. There's always going to be some people who will not want to hear it. But I think most people are fairly fair-minded. And if you approach how we communicate on, on TV shows, on radio, on, on in writing, with that in mind, I think we can get a lot done. So most people in prison come from marginalised groups where they've had little good opportunities for growing up, and too often they've experienced poverty, family back breakdown, they've been in care, experienced abuse. Does that apply to you? How would you describe your own background and how does it relate to your later imprisonment yeah i think that's a really good question i think certainly when i was in prison something that really struck me was how uh i suppose many or most of the, the men that i shared imprisonment with had far more excuse let's say for being in prison than i did many of them had really poor family backgrounds had been abused physically and sexually had uh, really limited levels of literacy and had often left education early without qualification so their chances of getting a law-abiding normal job I think pretty marginal and in that sort of situation I think it's quite easy I certainly found it easy to understand why they might turn to drug dealing for example as a, as a means of earning a living and I was very aware that I didn't have any of that kind of trauma. I had all sorts of opportunity and privilege in my upbringing. And I think sometimes that made me feel especially guilty, actually. I didn't, didn't think I had the kind of excuse they did. Later on, though, it was quite interesting as I got to know some of the men better and we talked about more kind of deep and meaningful things. It was interesting to discover the points of similarity. So I remember one conversation with a uh, um, a black man from South London, roughly the same age as me, both born in the same year. And we were talking about our kind of lives before prison. And what I thought was really interesting is we both developed the same kind of really flawed attitude to being a man from very different parts. Of it. So, so, so we both felt this really strong need to be seen as strong, to be seen as in control, to not show weakness. And we were from completely different parts, developed those very similar attributes. And in my case, it came, I think, from a, I went to a particularly unpleasant prep school when I was seven, eight, nine years old. And I think the kind of lessons I internalized there were that to ever show weakness made you vulnerable. It meant pain and fear. And that, that from, from that point on, I, I learned to build this shell around myself almost. This sort of layers of, of protection where I never really let anyone in, never let anyone see what I was actually feeling or if I was worried about things or scared about things. 
And in, in a very similar way, this chap I'm thinking of, and, and many other men like him, developed that sort of habit from their upbringings as well. So was prison what you expected? No, I hope you ever have to go to prison. But if, if, if you are in a position where you think you might be going to prison, you try to figure out what it's going to be like. And I had about a year between pleading guilty and being sentenced where I was just waiting. And I think the problem is actually good, reliable information about prison is really hard to come by. And so we think about media portrayals, which are mostly about the US system and those that do exist about the UK system are flawed and inaccurate. So I expected violence to be at risk of violence all the time, to be feel scared. Um, I expected to be lots of drugs. I expected it to be a sort of constant experience of being on edge and being frightened. And it wasn't like that. I don't think I ever really felt physically at risk in prison, or not from other people anyway. There were times when I realised that, that if there was a fire, there's no way they'd be able to get us out in time and that sort of thing. But... Most of the violence that I saw in prison, I think, happens between people who are involved in, in gang activity, involved in the drugs trade, or have you know, incurred a debt which they haven't repaid. So it's, a, to an extent, a self-selecting group. And I would say, generally, if you are not involving yourself in those worlds, you won't really come under threat of violence. I, I certainly didn't, didn't, didn't feel I did either. But what's much worse about prison is, I think, the kind of the stuff that's less obvious. So the the soundscape, the the kind of the constant thumping of boots on on concrete, the slamming of of iron gates, the rattling of keys, men shouting, mm-hmm. guards shouting back at them at night time, people screaming and howling and hammering on their on their cell doors. That I think after a while becomes uh, very traumatizing. I think it. And what I've found since prison, and I, and I know other people I was in prison with, I took those found the same thing that we just find peace and quiet much more appealing now. And being in loud spaces is very difficult. And I think the other piece of imprisonment, which I think is really hard to describe, but really bad, is this the way it gradually just wears your soul down. I think the constant mundanity of the experience, the lack of of choice the lack of fresh air, of countryside, of nourishing human relationships, of of healthy touch, the lack of anything positive to really do, particularly in closed prisons like Wandsworth, where I spent half my sentence. I think after a while, that just really just grinds you down. And that was exacerbated during my sentence because it overlapped with, with the first phase of the COVID lockdown. So during that period, we were all locked in ourselves for 23 or 24 hours every day. So if you can imagine a space roughly the size of a car parking space, that's your cell. And now you've got a bed, a bunk bed, so two of you sleep there. You've got a, a little sink, you've got a toilet, a tiny walkway area, tiny window, and a, a sort of desk. And there's very little space. And so being crammed in an environment like that for almost all or all of every day, often not being allowed out even to get a shower or for fresh air and exercise or to see the sky, I think that definitely was one of the harder things to deal with. Yeah, that's real deprivation, isn't it? Thanks very much, David. How did you get on in prison, David? What was it like to be in prison as someone from an upper middle class background? This also surprised me. I suppose I expected that I might be picked on because my accent would be unusual in prison. And my accent is unusual in prison. But one of the strange things I came to realise quite quickly about the British prison system is actually the class system is, if anything, more apparent there. And I think because of a combination of my accent and my skin colour, got treated often much better by the prison officers. Uh, I don't think any of the... The prisoners took against me because of my accent. I think they often found me an object of curiosity in some cases. But fundamentally, you're all in the same boat as prisoners. You're all in the same space doing the same. One day in prison is much like another. You're all doing time. And I think that shared experience is quite unifying. So I didn't feel any discord there. But certainly a lot of the other men on my landing would often deputise me and say, you go up and speak to the governor about this because they knew I'd get a better answer. And that was strange. 
it was surprising and odd to me that as a, a prisoner convicted of a, a crime of gross dishonesty, a fraud, who um, in prison, I was still treated differently and better by the prison officers simply because of my class background. I think that was a very strange thing. Uh, be, I, I don't know if that works like that in other prison systems, but definitely in the English prison system, there's a lot of classism. I find that absolutely fascinating, to be honest with you. I haven't worked in prisons for the best part of uh, 20 years. I, I do find it quite surprising uh, and fascinating to to hear that. But having worked with somebody else who did come from quite a, an upper middle class background, I think certainly I think there was a sense of fear about what education brings that perhaps might have conferred on him some opportunities on occasion. Mm. Um Emotional well-being correlates with physis, that innate need for humans to grow. Does prison enable this in any way? That's a really good question. I think any horrible life experience probably does carry within it the potential for growth. Uh, I wouldn't recommend a prison sentence as a route to personal growth, but I think I did find that there's a lot of time to think and reflect and... I suppose I did spend a lot of time running back through my memories my whole life and, and just thinking about choices I'd made and what path different choices would have taken me on. Um, and I think I had to go back. I kept going back and I was almost trying to figure out what the most recent point was I could have made a different choice in order to have avoided the path I'd ended up in. And I think that time and space certainly gives you the potential and the sort of the space to to be very introspective and to think about things and i think if if you are very lucky and determined and and you might get some positivity out of that but i would still say it's a sort of a huge waste of of, of time and i think what would be if i was designing a perfect prison system i would say that on, on you know week one we need to be figuring out every prisoner how long are they going to be there what are their educational and training and therapeutic needs and then there's a bespoke program for each person and i would be looking at fairly aggressively therapizing people to try and help them figure out the reasons for their offending or their reoffending, and, and and try and help help prisoners to get to where they're not going to reoffend on release uh and there's none of that in prison really the only people who get uh, any kind of meaningful therapeutic interventions are people who've committed very serious crimes. I'm sure you guys are aware. So, you know, it's sex offenders, murderers, essentially. Some sort of very violent offenders as well. But for most prisoners, they are just there to serve their sentence and that's it. Thank you. I just wanted to guess the answer from that previous question, but does the prison system know what to do with people who've committed fraud? I don't think the prison is with, with with anyone. I think there are some specific efforts to do things with sex offenders, with particularly violent criminals, and, and there's a sort of fairly well defined pathway for, for those groups of offenders. How effective it is, I think, is still open to debate. And there's different studies which suggest that it may or may not be particularly effective. But for the vast bulk of offenders who are crimes of property, including fraud and and, and drug crime, essentially. I don't think the prison system doesn't really have a clue. And when you get imprisoned, after a few days there, you'll get a copy of your order of imprisonment, which the judge produced your sentencing. And that will say the reason for your sentence. And in most cases, it just says punishment. There's no sort of real engagement, the idea that prison might rehabilitate or reform. And I think that's a, something we should be outraged about as a society. The, the, the human and financial cost of reoffending is so high. And we should want to have a prison system which actually works on each individual prisoner such that when they are released they are less likely to offend them when they came in and prison really does nothing positive and i think also in some of the ways it's set up and functions it probably makes reoffending more likely because of the moral lessons and behavioral lessons it teaches i think we've touched recently in the podcast on the fact that if you were designing a system to address the address crime and prevent recidivism you it wouldn't look anything like the prison system that we have would it 
we've touched a little bit on the fact that you're quite a creative person in terms of writing articles for publication and you've also previously I believe made a film but also wondered how you channeled your creative energy whilst you're in prison. I decided when I was there I was going to write um, so every day I wrote a journal I wrote about a thousand words every day just detailing my experience capturing events that happened how I was feeling how things smelled how they looked how they sounded and that was a really wonderful tool for helping me to cope with and process what was happening around me and what I was experiencing. But also it's been really useful since because I've been able to go back to that and refer to it when I'm writing about prison. I think having a journal which captures how you actually felt in a given moment is a really wonderful thing to, to have. So I, I still journal now. And I think in the same way that, that taking photos of everything lets us capture what things look like and what we were doing, journaling helps us actually freeze our feelings in particular moments. That was a wonderful thing. I started writing a, a novel this was sort of during the covid lockdown there's nothing to do so i'm gonna, gonna write a novel so i i started by hand writing this novel which is really painful and every time you have to redraft something you have to write a little by out by hand again this got some tip so that was quite slow and after i'd been in the wandsworth for a couple of months i heard about this thing called the coastal prize which is a arts creative arts competition run for prisoners and i entered two short stories and a couple of poems into that in 2020 that was the first time i'd ever entered any writing for anything and that was a few months later i got a certificate back and a prize and some feedback like some actual sort of constructive feedback on my writings that was really wonderful and that that encouraged me and then when i eventually transferred to an open prison uh, halsey bay in in late 2020 i then started an ma in creative writing i did about half of that before i was released i, I finished it after release last year and that sort of has spurred me to write more. I ended up giving up on the novel that I'd been writing in, in prison because it didn't really work. But now I'm most of the way through a new novel. So hopefully that will I'll see the light of day at some point. It's really interesting to hear you talk about the power of writing and how the journaling, for instance, because we previously had a guest on Hugh Venables who spoke about journaling and really encouraging listeners to use that as a way of supporting their own well-being and finding a way to have your own psychologist in your pocket, so to speak, through that journaling process. Yeah, I think it's wonderful. I, I I think it's great for that, but actually also it's just a lo lovely to be able to look back at it. My wife and I have recently welcomed our, our first child into the world and it's been wonderful sort of to to look back and, and read through what I was writing at different stages of pregnancy and, and to, to write every day and capture uh, Primrose's development stages and that sort of thing. That's really, really special. So, moving on a little bit, David, one of the things you said to me in conversation previously it was moral choice as a habit. What, what did you mean by this? Yeah, I think, so certainly for me, um, so my offence is fraud, which is obviously a, a offence of dishonesty. That was not the first dishonest thing I'd, I'd done. I do think it was the first time I'd done something which crossed the, the, the line from, you know, dishonesty into criminality. But I think the, I, I'd spent quite a long time working in, in sort of salesy roles and situations in which uh, I suppose you were encouraged uh, to fake it till you make it to put the best spin on things all these sort of phrases we use to describe acts of, of dishonesty right so I think because I'd built a habit of, of being dishonest on small points when a big decision came my my bias was already to, to be dishonest uh, and I think habit is as I get older I more and more think that habit's probably the most one of the most powerful things in determining how we behave I think for for physical exercise, for the ways we behave with other people, and for for our work patterns, and I, I have a theory that it's much much easier to do something every day than it is three times a week. So I run every day because actually, if it's just something you do every day, it's much easier. In the same way, if you just consciously always choose to be honest, or always be compassionate, or always say I'm going to give people the benefit of the doubt, then that will be the way your decision making biases. This isn't a new idea. This is Aristotle talks about this, right? So this is a very old idea. I think it, I suppose what I've come to realise from my own life and kind of internalise is actually that if, if you can build, habit does eventually become personality because if you do something all the time, it just becomes how you respond. And so much of our response to situations is almost instinctual, automatic, non-conscious that if we've built a habit up of behaving in a way which is negative, 
then I think we'll we'll default that. And I suspect the same is true for, for let's say, violent criminals, who probably have built a pattern of aggressive violent responses to stressful situations. But taking that up a bit, David, because we often tend to think that honesty and dishonesty are like burned into the character and so it can't be changed and people can learn how to control their anger a bit uh, better at least mm. more easily than dishonest people can learn to be honest what do you make of that i've never been a violent person so i can't tell you how easy it is to shift that kind of thinking i i would tend to categorize all behaviors as habit really mm. so, so i i don't actually see that there's a huge difference there I think they're about how you respond in situations, right? So often violence is a it's either a threat response or it's it's to achieve a goal. And I think dishonesty is is the same. Like people often lie, I, I said, because we, we feel emotionally vulnerable. So we are dishonest about something in order to protect ourselves because we don't want to face consequences or we lie to to gain advantage. And so I suppose I would say that both violence and dishonesty are maladaptive coping strategies which human beings use to interact with each other. And they're probably more similar than different in those senses. You seem to be, uh, I, th I think, linking dishonesty in with emotional regulation in a way that perhaps isn't very often spoken about or thought about. So we understand that violence is because people can't manage their feelings of anger but maybe hurt that everything that's hurtful gets challenged and in, channeled into anger instead and then violence is the ensuing result but I suppose you seem to be talking about something quite similar maybe with dishonesty if I understood you correctly that actually rather than perhaps managing your own vulnerability it'd be easier to front it out and I suppose when you were talking about the sales it sounded like bullshit's a, a slippery slope yes. down to dishonesty I think bullshitting is a form of dishonesty, right? So I think we there's a, a peculiar way as a society that we, we categorise some forms of dishonesty as, as acceptable and some as not acceptable. And I think if you have quite a literalist brain like I do, that's quite hard to, to grasp. But yeah, I think, again, certainly for me, and I've, I've seen it in other people as well, I think often lying is about not wanting to feel pain and feel consequence right people will lie to their spouse or partner about whether they've gone to the pub or not because they don't want to be shouted people will lie about their own feelings because they don't want to go into it and have a breakup they will people will lie about how how happy they are how successful they are at work because they want to be seen as successful they don't want to be seen in a negative light by people around them and i think yeah there's a i think a lot of that is about something it was, was for me is about that I was very scared of being seen as who I am and I think something in a strange way that's been quite positive about the experience of having my kind of reputation destroyed by going through the, the court process and then going to prison is once you've lost all your reputation you don't worry about it anymore and that's quite freeing and I think not having to worry about that sort of thing means you don't I certainly don't feel that need to sort of put up a front anymore I just say this is who I am and I think it took me the best part of 40 years to get to that point in my life. I'm glad I have. But I but I, I do believe that for a lot of people, lying does come from a place. Of, it's either instrumental or it's about emotional vulnerability or both. But again, I think violence is probably those things as well. So I think they are, I do agree, that I think they are quite similar in what motivates them. I think it does, but I, I suppose what, was, what I found intriguing was I suppose, maybe it challenged my own kind of like preconceptions or what have you but there I think sometimes there's more within mental health professionals perhaps more judgmentalism about the dishonesty so mm. there's a kind of that that sense of oh, somebody's been overwhelmed when they've when they've become angry and violent and obviously that's not to say that that's acceptable but it's understandable mm nature element to it whereas I think if mental health professionals were able to think about lying as serving a, a purpose in terms of emotional regulation I think there might be a little bit more compassion 
for that. Whereas I think people can actually get quite angry uh, at the sense that they're being lied to. That's interesting, isn't it? There is this hierarchy we apply to, to kinds of crime, both within and without the prison system. I wonder if the lack of compassion does come from the fact that people, obviously now people don't have being hit either, but probably more mental health professionals have been lied to than have been hit. And to be successfully lied to, I think, creates feelings of of almost self-loathing, right? So it's a, I think, quite a, it can make people who've who've been on the receiving end of lies, who the victims of lies, feel that they've lost their kind of sense, their own judgment is is flawed, they're not able to assess people correctly. It can be very destabilising, I I would think, to the but to their sense of talk certainly has been to me when I've been lied to. And it makes us call into question all sorts of things about who we are. And perhaps because we live in a society which is in historical terms very low violence, and most people have not been on the on the end of, of kind of serious violence, and probably even more so that's the case with with mental health professionals who are more likely to be from, from privileged and middle class backgrounds. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe if I'm, I'm not advocating the punching of mental health professionals, but maybe part of it is that they're much more likely to have been on the receiving end of dishonesty in other parts of their lives, and it's hard to disaggregate that. Thank you. I think you're right there. Thanks very much. So, David, you just started a PhD. What are you researching into? Yeah, at the age of 41 with a newborn baby. Possibly not my, my greatest idea. I, I, when I had that year three PhD emotional collapse that everyone seems to have I'll, I'll probably be cursing myself um so I'm I started a PhD at the University of Southampton it'll be a PhD in law technically but what I'm going to be researching is the impact of parental imprisonment on children uh so we don't actually know how many children in the UK have a parent in prison I think the, the latest estimate is maybe a hundred thousand in any given year uh, but there's no real record kept of it and it's hard as well because a third of those children approximately don't have any contact with those parents in prison and another third don't visit them and have sporadic telephone or letter contact. Uh, but we do know the effects of parental imprisonment are really bad. It's linked to greater likelihood of ending up in prison as an adult, linked to poorer performance in school, more, more criminality generally, mental health issues. It's it's one of the big traumatic childhood experiences, uh, adverse uh, childhood experiences, which can make a huge difference to lives. So what I'm interested in is actually how we build a framework for explaining what's going on to children because when you talk to adults who as children had parents in prison they they often uh describe the similar themes they talk about feeling a great sense of shame that they are they felt culpable for and stained by their parents crime they often also feel that they're excluded from society um and they can't interact with people in the same way and they regularly talk about feeling betrayed and lied to by other adults who often from with good intentions lie to them and say dad's overseas on the merchant marine or he's away working that's why he can't call you very often and when the child finds out they feel very betrayed and there's a breakdown in trust with other adults uh what i'm going to be doing is actually researching directly with the children of, of prisoners to establish what sort of information and styles of communication would work for them in order to hopefully mitigate some of the harms of that experience. No, I thought that was I thought that was really interesting. We did a, a conversation previously with Shona Minson, who also, oh, yeah. also yeah. researches the effects of parental imprisonment on children. But it's really, and it was quite a painful conversation to listen to, but also really interesting to hear that you're action focused in terms of trying to help find a better way for managing that going forward but I'm sure you're going to have to manage some quite difficult emotional experiences during that research which I suppose brings us to our our final question really that Bruce Filer writes about the importance of crisis for people to make transitions and achieve growth and you seem to be a living embodiment of that really that you took a, a time that a time period that that was very dark but actually you managed to get through that crisis and grow what helps you use your crisis to grow rather than getting stuck in the the middle of it is there anything that you could share with listeners that they might be able to take hmm. some kind of inspiration from i'm not I'm not sure how much inspiration i can share but i i, I, I could certainly try and answer it i think this isn't a very helpful point but, but i think having a 
as good family support network makes a huge difference. So while I was in prison, my family were incredibly supportive and uh, very much there for me and I'm on release as well. I think having that kind of, that was very powerful, having good friends who I could phone from prison all the time and speak to and and have that sort of regular, those touch points with outside helped a lot. And obviously, if you don't have that, you can't replicate it. So I was very lucky to have those things and lots of people in prison don't. I think what I did do when I arrived in prison was I thought, okay, whatever happens, you're here for the next 20 months. And I thought, okay, that time's going to pass in any event. And I can either let it pass and be wasted or and then feel like that's two years of my life that's been stolen um, that I, I won't get back. Or I can do something positive with it. And I thought, okay, so therefore I'm going to do my very best to make sure I, I leave prison in better physical, emotional and mental shape. Where am I going? And I, I took that attitude every day. So I, when I went to prison, I was very overweight. And I dropped over the course of my sentence about 35 kilos and got into, really got into running and took just charge of that. And I, I think I tried to always cultivate an attitude of personal responsibility as well. A lot of people in prison will either tell you they, they weren't really guilty or they have reasons for their crime and justifications. And I thought, well, actually, that's not actually, it's not a helpful framing, even if it is true, because actually the, the better thing is to say, okay, actually, I, I made choices, which is the reason I'm here. And therefore, I have the ability to make different choices in the future. And I think that's a much more powerful and effective way of, of framing life. And I think that applies in and out of prison. I think we are you know, sentient beings with free will. We have choice. And I think that's, that's, one of the most powerful tools we have. And I think focusing on that and being really present and conscious of that was what was helpful. I, I think one of the big ones is faith, is God. I think there uh, there was some interesting research I saw as presented at the Howard Lee conference last last September. I can't remember the, the name of the professor who presented, but she was very impressive. And she she was doing a very different piece of research, but she started to notice that actually religiosity seem to be pretty strongly linked linked with better mental health and physical health outcomes in custody, but also better outcomes on release. And I think I've certainly found that to be the case. I think the sort of support network within the prison system, if you, if you are religious, you can actually attend regular acts of worship. It's a sort of normality there. It's very powerful. But I think also the... Yeah, I think certainly for me, I've found that, that faith and that belief is very... A powerful and simultaneously re remind is a good reminder of the need to be virtuous and, and also I think a, a kind of reassurance that actually it, it will be okay so I think those are the big factors I think the other thing is trying to be purposeful about things any I think you can nibble away at tasks and you will you can achieve a huge amount so when I started trying to run I didn't even run a mile. I was so out of shape. I'd come to prison really fat, and I hadn't. I'd been in a cell during COVID for a year, hadn't moved, couldn't even run half a mile. I just kept going out every day and doing what I could. Um, and similarly, I started writing, and I just wrote what I could every day. And it, if you write every day, you get better at it, and you write more. And if you run every day, you get better at it, and you write more. And if you uh, focus on on being mindful and, and being virtuous every day, you'll get better at it. If you focus on being compassionate and forgiving every day, you'll get better at that as well. And I think you've, you've got to... I think often lots of people will will look at a thing they'd like to achieve and it can seem so distant and so vast, this huge mountain, they think it's not even worth trying. But actually, if you just do something every day to approach it, you'd be surprised how quickly you get there. And I think that as a sort of approach to life I came to settle on in prison is one I found to be very helpful afterwards as well. Um, so I, I really enjoyed your answer there, actually, I thought it, and I thought it was very inspirational as an answer. Thank you. I've really enjoyed the conversation today, David. Yeah, thanks very much indeed, David. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys.